Good morning. My name is Chris Hansen, and I welcome you to our worship service. At Church of the Nativity, we believe that all people are of sacred worth. We warmly welcome people of every age, language, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical and mental ability, economic means, marital status, and family structure into the full fellowship, membership, leadership, ministry, worship, and sacramental life of our congregation. As a loving and inclusive faith community, we welcome seekers, doubters, and believers. As we say in the United Church of Christ, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, church. Welcome to worship this morning at the mighty Church of the Nativity. It is so good to see all of you here in the sanctuary. We welcome those who are with us on live stream as well. Good to be together as the body of Christ on this rainy day. So lots going on today. We have um, our wonderful chancel choir here and also our bell choir here, both under the direction of music director Andrew Stevens. Um, Debbie Komarowski's team, without Debbie, is uh, <laughs> uh, greeting you this morning, and we're glad for that. Chris Hansen, our liturgist, um, and upstairs, Rich DeVito, Rick DeVito, Dan Hess, and uh, Frank DeMart are up there making the AV go, so appreciate all of those efforts. Um, you will see announcements uh, in your nativity notes. None of them, I think, necessarily needs to be repeated um, other than... Um, well, let me, let me just say a couple of other additional things. One is many of you would have received an email to this effect, but, but I want to be sure that you know that Jean Breland passed away, I think it was Sunday night, and there will be a service for Jean at 6.30 tomorrow evening up at the Wiedekin Funeral Home on Delaware Avenue. So if you knew Jean or her kids, uh, Carol and Steve, um, you, you might want to, uh, to come to that service. Um, if you are the parent of a child in our uh, Sunday school, um, Lee asked me to remind you to pick up your children's newsletter that will be available in your child's class today, so don't forget to do that. Um, today we have an um, annual meeting of the Church of the Nativity where we will talk about our budget, talk about um, what has gone on in the past year and what our hopes are for this coming year. So my understanding is that that all happens straight away after the postlude. So we'll have our, our worship, Andrew will play, and um, you all might want to stand, stretch for one minute, and then sit back down. We'll have that annual meeting here. The good news, uh, the carrot at the end of this is it's followed by lunch down in the dining room. So we hope you can stay for both of those events. Really an important part of the old congregational tradition of self-governance that we work together to decide how to run the church. So please do stay for that time. I just want to say one other word of celebration, which I just learned this morning, and that is that our friend Wilongo has become a United States citizen as of January 11th. <laughs> A joyous moment for him and his family, a joyous moment for America, right? We have a new, a new citizen, so congratulations, Wilonga. We are, we are very glad. We are very glad. I think that's what we need to say. Uh, children's message today, a weird old sermon. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> welcome to worship.
please join me in the call to worship. Holy One, who may abide in your sanctuary? Who may dwell in your sacred creation? Those who do justice, those who confront iniquities and uplift the oppressed. Holy One, who may abide in your sanctuary? Who may dwell in your sacred creation? Those who love kindness, those who love neighbor, friend, and foe. Holy One, who may abide in your sanctuary? Who may dwell in your sacred creation? Those who walk humbly with you, those who follow your lead, and answer your call. Please be seated. <coughs> Let us pray together our gathering prayer. Just and loving God, we enter into your sacred spaces, in sanctuaries and in homes, in public gatherings and in private places. You bridge time and space to forge us as a beloved community. You, O Southern, make plain the way of life for us. Encourage us to join your journey, to love your children and creation, and to help build your realm on earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And I know we do have some young people amongst us this morning. I would invite you to come on forward as you are able, and let's have a little time together. We're going to talk some football, all right? Come on down. How are you guys? Come come this way so I can yell at you that way. Everybody good? Right off from getting here? This is good. So, way back in the before times, before you guys were born, the Buffalo Bills were in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Actually, they were four times in the Super Bowl. You have probably heard this story. But I want to talk to you about the first time, because the first time we were so close. We were playing the New York Giants, and you guys can tell the story as, better, as well as I can. The Bills were behind by one point, and they drove down the field, and then all they had to do, it was almost like the last minute, all they had to do was to kick a field goal and they would win the Super Bowl. There would be a party in Buffalo. Guess what happened? They missed it. The kicker, Scott Norwood, the second most famous Scott in Buffalo, got up, to, he got all ready, and he went to kick the field goal, and he kicked it, and it went far enough, but it went Five. wide right. <laughs> Terrible thing. Everybody was really sad. And here's what happened. The next day, I think it was, the team came back from wherever it was, Florida or something, where the Super Bowl was, and there was a big party downtown in Niagara Square to welcome the team home. And you know what the crowd did at that party? They chanted, we want Scott, we want Scott. And Scott Norwood came up and they cheered for him, even though he missed the field goal that would have won the game. Now, that happened a long time ago, 1990. Last Sunday, <laughs> last Sunday, the Bills were playing the Kansas City Chiefs. You know this story, right? And the Bills were behind by three points. Maybe, maybe you know this, but they had a chance to tie the game. We know they could have won it in overtime. And Tyler Bass, the Bills kicker, who made 28 field goals in a row this season, lined up to kick the field goal that would tie the game. What happened? Missed, Missed it. Wide right again. Can you believe it? So you can see the picture. I've got the picture here, but you can see it up on the screen. Um, and so you can see the Chiefs players. How are they feeling about this event? They're pretty happy, right? How's Tyler Bass feeling in this picture? 
Man, what a bummer, right, for him? Walked off the field. Bills lost the game. Nothing to watch on TV today. <laughs> right? So here's what I want to say about that. Kind of bad history has repeated itself there. But an amazing thing happened, just like it did with Scott Norwood. Because you know how football players, sometimes they do things in the community and they help um, groups in the community that do important stuff. So Tyler Bass is associated with this group called the 10 Lives Club, which is about um, rescuing cats that are like, you know, out on the street or whatever and they need a home. And this 10 Lives Club brings them to the shelter and takes care of them until people can adopt them. Yeah. Cats have nine lives, that's, that's what they say, right. So that's, that's why this club is called the Ten Lives Club. They're giving them one more chance at a good life. And people knew, uh, Bill's fans knew that Tyler Bass uh, had an interest in this club. And some pretty mean things had been said about Tyler Bass on like, Facebook and social media. And the Bill's fans thought that was not right. So they started sending money to this 10 Lives Club. And they sent money, and they sent money, and they sent money. And last I saw, there was $280,000 that came to this little cat shelter because people wanted to support Tyler Bass, who made that terrible miss. So I guess I want to say two things about that, other than array for all of those cats who will have a new life. But thing one is Tyler Bass is one of the greatest athletes in the country, right? You don't get to be an NFL player without being an amazing athlete. And he made a mistake. The thing is, that is only one part of who he is as a person and as an athlete. Sometimes even when you're at the top of your game, you can make a mistake. It is not the end of the world, okay? There's always another game. Bills did not fire him, and um, we will go forth. The other thing I want to say about this is, even though everybody in Buffalo, I, th I think, was pretty upset about the result of this game, a pretty good thing happened out of that especially if you are a cat wandering around <laughs> Buffalo, right? And so it seems to me that when lousy things happen in our lives, we might want to remind ourselves that they look lousy on the face of it, but maybe some good can come out of it. And I believe anyway that God can always make a good thing out of something that looks to us pretty bad. Okay? That is the story of two Bill's kicks. There will be more to come. Okay? <laughs> Thank you for sharing this time with me. Have an excellent day in Sunday school. Our Bible reading for today is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 17 through 21 and 27 through 30, from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there have been divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you proceeds to eat your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. Whoever, therefore, 
eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So ends our hearing of these ancient words. May God's Spirit open our hearts and minds to understand the meaning they have for us today. Thank you, Chris. A yeah, different kind of scripture today, right? We haven't heard that uh, so much. We have to begin this morning with a Surgeon General's warning. Listening to today's message may make your head explode. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to blow your mind, so do not say that you were not warned. I want to bring to us today a perspective on Holy Communion that is new to me, but has really gotten me thinking, thinking about the meaning of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, thinking about our encounter with God in the bread and cup, and thinking about how the early Christians meant to share food and drink and worship, what it meant to them and what it means to us all these centuries later, as month by month we do the same. And mostly my thinking about this has come out of a book called The Immortality Key. It's by a guy named Brian Murarescu. And he is an international trade lawyer, Washington, D.C., but that is just his day job. On his own time, he's, he's kind of like Indiana Jones, I guess. He's a swashbuckling investigator of ancient mysteries. Before he went to Georgetown Law School, he went to Brown University, and he studied Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit there. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and he knows the people who maintain the Vatican's secret archives, and he talks at shop with the best antiquarians and classicists of Europe. This is a scary, smart guy. So in our journey today, we start not with the early Christian church, but farther back, actually way farther back. Because when we think about human beings relate to the divine, we have to recognize that it didn't start with the coming of Jesus. It didn't even start with the Jewish faith out of which Christianity grew. It started as soon as our ancestors crawled up out of the mud and grew enough cerebellum to wonder at the way things are. Because ever since there have been people, people have tried to understand what or who runs the world. We are pattern-seeking creatures. There is something, I think, deep inside of us that drives us Try to figure it out. As Voltaire said, as if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. We need something bigger than ourselves to believe it. So God, our God, the God we know, is eternal. The book of Genesis tells us that God the Creator, of course, existed at the beginning of time. But there have always been competing God. The Romans had a dozen gods, half of them, by the way, women. The ancient Greeks had 12 as well. There were statues and shrines to them all over the place. They were objects of worship. There was competition amongst the gods, and people looked to certain gods for specific favors, like the blessing of a good harvest. There have been competing gods forever. For that matter, you know, there are competing gods Today, a lot of people today worshiping out at the shrine of Josh Allen, right? And so it is no surprise that worship cults grew up around some of these non-Jehovah gods. And one of these was the cult of Persephone, 
whom the ancient Greeks worshipped as the goddess of the harvest. She was the object of a cult that grew up uh, physically around the temple of Eleusis, which was a few miles northwest of Athens. And the legend was that Persephone, this goddess, had been abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld, dragged down to the underworld, and then returned to the surface, just as a seed is planted in the earth and then sprouts back to life. And in that legend is the promise of rebirth, and in some tellings, eternal life. That sounds maybe a little familiar, right? For those of us who find hope in Christ's resurrection, it's a familiar and a powerful story. And it became the basis for a worship cult that lasted 2,000 years, from about 1600 BCE to about 400 years after Christ. But for me, anyway, it is how this cult worship that is really interesting. Once a year, a select group of people would be allowed into this sacred temple at Eleusis. And to take part, everyone had to swear a vow of secrecy about it. And they spent a full year in preparation. There were sacrifices and purification rituals and prayers and fasting. Finally, they gathered in this great hall of the temple. And there, there were sacred objects and there were reenactments of the ancient myths. And all of this culminated in the drinking of kaikia, a drink made of water and barley. Kind of a beer, actually. And what happened next? These spiritual seekers had encounters with the goddess Persephone, actual face-to-face -face encounters. The goddess was there among them and their lives would change. So what made this possible, this encounter with the divine? It's often in extreme circumstances like fasting and maybe staying up all night that people have spiritual experiences. Maybe that explains it. But there is a line of scholarship that raises an intriguing idea. Maybe they were under the influence of a psychoactive drug. Hold with me. Specifically, this author, Mark Bramarescu, points to a particular kind of ergot, which is a fungus that grows on grains like barley, and was known to be present in the crops in this area of Greece. And this ergot, it looks like a smudgy black tar, has a chemical composition very similar to LSD. And so the theory goes that when they drank the sacred kaikia, and, they, and when that was brewed, it carried this chemical with it. And this is what the initiates drank to break their fast. And then they encountered Persephone. But wait, there's more. Fast forward to the first few centuries after Christ, when the early Christian church was taking shape, they were making it up as they went along, right? Creating a whole new religion out of whole cloth. Deciding what gospels and letters they should study and take as sacred. And developing their own rituals of remembrance. The earliest followers of Christ, as a reminder, did not worship in cathedrals or in nice suburban buildings or even in little country churches. They formed house churches. They worshipped in each other's living rooms. And you remember that we talked about the problem of competing gods. The early Christian church was operating in a society with a lot of gods. You can even see this in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians, for example, Paul addresses the question of whether it's okay for believers to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols, which apparently happened a lot. And he says, sure, eat the meat because, you know, there's only one true God anyway. But he is matter of fact about these idols. They were just a fact of life. And it is evident that within this society there was competition, this whole menu of gods to choose from. The early Christian church 
had to make itself stand out in order to grow. And here's where it gets interesting. It is clear that Holy Communion was central to the worship of the early church. It's evident that they took Holy Communion every time they gathered. And in our scripture reading today, Paul scolds this church at Corinth for doing communion wrong. They are drawing dividing lines about who is worthy to receive the elements. They are eating too much, and they are depriving others of the meal. Some of them are drinking too much, and they are getting drunk. And at the end of the passage that Chris read for us, he says, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Well, huh. Some pretty strong communion wine, isn't it? Well, yes. Some scholars are finding evidence that the wine in those early house churches was not your five o'clock Pinot Noir. They're saying it is possible that like the powerful Kaikim of the temple at Eleusis, the wine served by those early Christians was imbued with a fungus that grows on the grapes, fungus that had psychoactive properties. No wonder they insisted on having communion every week. <laughs> they were drinking spiked wine. And they were seeing God. <laughs> I said to Andrew, this is a sermon that could only be preached in a UCC church. <laughs> And I want to be clear, though, that we're not talking about hallucinations here. These are not the fantastical inventions of a disordered mind. In fact, there's research going on right now at Johns Hopkins University and at NYU into the practical applications of psychoactive substances, and particularly the mushroom compound psilocybin. And they have shown, these researchers, have shown incredible promise with these drugs for treating post-traumatic stress disorder, and alcoholism, and depression, treating the fear of death in people with terminal cancer. This is really interesting research. And one area that these researchers are looking at is whether psychoactive drugs can act as a catalyst for spiritual experiences. And, this, and then in this contract, Context, in this context, these drugs are called entheogens. Entheogens because they enable an experience of the whole. And the theory is that they act in the brain to open up a pathway for an experience of God, who, as we know, is all around us, right, and always looking for ways to reach out to us. So, not hallucinations, opening the door of the mind to God. So I guess then we have to ask, well, why are you and I not drinking psychoactive wine around the Lord's table today? Why didn't this kind of communion carry on through the history of the Christian church? There was just one problem. Women, no offense. Because the theory goes that when the Emperor Constantine agreed that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire in the year 381, he had to put his foot down and exercise some control. They couldn't have this cabal of house churches running loosey-goosey without any oversight. And when they swooped in, they discovered that the Christians in charge of formulating the communion wine were the women who cooked it up in their kitchens and passed the recipes down from generation to generation. And in a patriarchal society, you cannot let women be in charge of access to the holy. And so the church fathers developed a new understanding of holy communion, a doctrine that we now know as transubstantiation, the belief that when the male priest blesses the bread and cup, that these elements in some essential way become the body and blood of Christ. 
the men had asserted themselves and the wine was weak. Now, I have to say that scholars disagree about these ideas. It may be pie in the sky to think that psychoactive wine was the key to the growth of the early Christian church. But there is evidence for this in the scriptures, in writings outside of the Bible, in archeological findings from this period. It is an intriguing idea. And if it did happen like that, well, I have to ask, how might that make a difference in how we practice our faith today? Well, I'm pretty sure nobody is looking to spike the communion wine here at Nativity. But when we worship, where are the places where we might meet the reality of God? Not just think for a little while about God or come to hear some interesting ideas about God, but have a burning bush experience of the whole. I think it's worth asking that question again and again, and really might be different for each of us. I know for me, you know, I feel God's presence as we share communion because I uh, feel a part of this group of faithful people, and I think God is really acting in that sacrament to call us together in love. There have been times when we pray together that I have been able to go deep into God's presence, really feel that God is right there, listening to all of us join in prayer. I hope maybe sometimes you feel that as well. But it is impossible to force that experience. And so really the best I have to offer is this. We invite God's presence when we open ourselves up to the surprising way that God moves here at church and really everywhere we live and breathe. We invite God's presence when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable to one another, to cast off that hard shell that insists on pretending that everything's fine. We invite God's presence when we come here on Sunday not as a diversion, not as like an hour of obligation, but to recommit ourselves to the truth that God is right before our eyes. He's knocking at the door of our heart, wanting to claim us as God's own. So go easy on the wine, but drink deep the possibilities. And know that God waits to meet us wherever, whoever we are, and love us right there. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you. Well, let's come together in prayer this morning. God, of every season we come before you at midwinter, praying for the new life that Christ promised to all who believe. We pray for those in our world for whom it always seems winter, with no hope of the warmth and brightness of spring just around the corner, those who have no food, no home, no money, no work, Help us find ways to share what we have with them. We pray for those, and we are many, who find it hard to accept ourselves the way we are, who choose to hide behind the masks of possessions and power. Help us to risk living with a little less of these, and to look at ourselves without fear through your eyes of love. God of creation, we pray for your world, teetering on the brink of a long, bitter winter brought about by human neglect. Help us to work to restore balance. Help us to rediscover and to observe the rhythms of creation which you so wisely put into place so that spring will follow winter and autumn, summer, and all may enjoy the fruits of your good creation. We pray for our congregation as we face the challenges of the future in this time of pastoral transition. We look for your will for us. Help us to be wise in deciding what to leave behind and what new vision we might want to pursue. And help us to trust you for the new spring of life which can flow out into our community. All of this, Lord, we pray in trust and in hope, and we pray in the familiar words of Jesus, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God calls us to generosity as we commit our time and money to Christ's work through our church. Many people donate through our website as recurring bank transfers or by mail. Gifts may also be made using stewardship or pew envelopes. The offering plate is next to the back pew. Thank you for your faithful giving. Let us join together in the prayer of dedication. God, we share our offerings in hope and trust that those gifts, your kingdom comes and your will is done. Amen. Thank you.
invite you to be seated for the postlude and for the annual meeting that will follow the postlude. Hear then these words as we almost go forth, right? <laughs> we do have this ministry. We have this ministry of being God's good news in a world that sorely needs to hear. So go now in peace, go in grace, go in love. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.